This is Kristen Vincent, Chair of the Westboro School Committee. Today is Wednesday, October 20th, 2021. This meeting of the Westboro School Committee is called to order. Please stand, if you are able, for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you for joining us this evening. Anyone attending the school committee meeting tonight is welcome to wear a mask if they choose. We ask that unvaccinated individuals wear a mask while in this building. I'd like to notify everyone in the room with us tonight that this meeting is being recorded by Westboro TV. School committee meetings are available for remote viewing or listening on Westboro TV's government channels, Verizon 28 and Charter 192, and online on the Westboro TV YouTube channel. A recording of this meeting will be posted on the Westboro uh, TV YouTube channel in the next day or so. And thank you to Westboro TV for covering the broadcast tonight. We have with us at this meeting Superintendent Amber Bach, Assistant Superintendent Dr. Daniel Mayer, Director of Finance and Administration David Gordon, Vice Chair of the Westboro School Committee Steve Durrett, School Committee members Sarah Dulay, Lisa Edinburgh, and Raghu Nandan, Student Representative Andrew Chen, and our Recording Secretary Jen Benton. And we have staff from Westboro TV handling the broadcast and recording of this meeting. I will review our agenda for tonight. We will have an approval of minutes from our October 4th retreat and October 6th regular session. We will then have superintendent's report, assistant superintendent's report, and a report from the director of finance and administration. Then we'll have school committee member reports, building project updates, citizens requests, approval of the superintendent's goals, an update from the borough program. And then we begin budget season with budget presentation number one, which will be an enrollment update. And then we will have a COVID update and brief discussion and we do not have a need for an executive session tonight. So we will begin with an approval of minutes. We will first approve the minutes from our October 4th retreat. So move. Thank you. A second. Thank you, Sarah. Any discussion about those minutes? All in favor? All right, so that's five zero in favor of approving those. And then we need to approve the minutes from October 6th regular session. I make a motion to approve the amended minutes from October 6th. Mm -hmm. um, Second. Thank you, Steve. And do you just want to share what yeah. the amendment is? Um, it's to the, under the Dr. Mayor's report, um, under, in the minutes, it says, Dr. Mayor gave an update on social emotional learning. John Crawford should be read. John Crocker met with the leadership team this morning. He was terrific. We will continue to work with him throughout the year. He trained all of our counselors last year. He teaches how to screen students who aren't presenting with the usual universal screeners and different ways of helping. We will send out a questionnaire to K through six to help identify students. There is also work, a work site trauma center called the Riverside Trauma Center to help counselors work with students who experience trauma. That was all. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion about the minutes? All in favor? Okay, so that's five zero and those minutes are approved as well and you sent your um, updates did. to Jen. Okay, great. So I'm gonna turn it over to our superintendent. <laughs> His report as well, so we can keep our notes clean. Um, <clears throat> two highlights I'd like to share. I'm sure we'll hear of exciting things coming up this weekend at the high school, and I'll let Andrew hold on to all that. Um, and I wanted to hold out two interesting highlights. Um, we started with our DEI team, which was a district-wide um, initiative to complement interfacing with Liza, our consultant, who Daniel will give you an update on tonight. We have 29 members of that committee. Uh, a vibrant group of people who stepped up from across district representing all the branches of diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, in our district from the preschool to the borough. We gathered yesterday at the preschool to um, bond as a team, to talk about the first set of goals, to spend some time identifying areas of question and how we would use our time together. 
I think it's a really thoughtful group. They encompass new faculty who bring a fresh set of eyes, skilled master level faculty who've been with us in district a long time, as well as an array of just different areas of, of DEI. So very exciting to see the range of things I think that we'll engage in talking about, and I look forward to keeping you updated. The next time they meet, we'll, we've just set our dates, we're gonna be moving into assessing the strategic plan for a lens around DEI across both the specified targets that we've identified, but then across the array of initiatives of inclusive practices and other arenas which encompass DEI, not just the um, diversity piece of, of DEI. So we'll be busy and that'll be our first piece of work. So that's one piece. I also want to mention that we have PD coming up this Friday for faculty. There's a lot of really intriguing and thoughtful work taking place on inclusive practices with speakers, workshops, and a range of things, as well as some SEI work. So um, SEL work, I was, we have so many acronyms at this point, some social emotional learning focus, as well as inclusive practices, kind of some of the themes I see emerging. And again, they rotate through those based upon district goals. So both areas that we want to continue to highlight to you. And that's my report for tonight. Thank you, and that's a good reminder that Friday is a half day of school. <laughs> Daniel? Hi, um, good evening. I want to clarify one thing about Friday. Uh, for the elementaries, they're, they're going to have parent conferences, so mm -hmm. um, Amber was referring to the secondary level. Um, so uh, a couple of different updates. One, um, I wanted to offer congratulations to our science coordinator, Rebecca Katch Singer, whose new book came out this week. Um, she co-authored it with a, f a few colleagues. Um, one f is a professor at uh, Boston College, and it's called The Instructional Leader's Guide to Implementing K-8 Science Practices. So um, it's a, uh, it's meant to be a primer on, on for administrators on, you know, what, what good science education looks like. And so um, I'm just, I wanted to give you that update. And then uh, as far as, as Amber uh, referred, uh, referenced, I was going uh, I wanted to give you a little more information of, about Dr. Uh, Liza Tullison, who um, I mentioned at our last meeting has started working with the, the administrative team um, on forming a strategic plan for working on um, equity issues in the district and, and, and inclusive practices. Um, and she's also gonna give a presentation in a couple of weeks for parents and for community members. And so I wanted to, uh, we'll send out something soon for, for a fa um, so that people can be on the lookout for it, but I wanted them to mark their calendars if they're interested that on November 8th, which is a Monday at seven o'clock for an hour, she is going to host a, uh, discussion about how to talk about diversity at home. And um, we're looking forward to introducing her to the community uh, and that we'll send out a, in, again in advance a, a notice with some of her biographical information and, and uh, details of, on how she's working with the district this year. Daniel, would that be an in-person or Zoom? Oh, sorry, okay. Zoom. Oh, okay. Yes. Great. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Dave, do you have anything? Uh, yes, just a brief update. Um, I just wanted to update the committee um, specifically regarding transportation and food service. Um, I believe at our last school committee meeting we were going to, I was going to spend some time talking to our new food service director about supply chain issues. Um, um, Jacob, our uh, food service director, was kind enough to put together a kind of a small blurb about it. Um, it, it was pretty candid regarding the, the issues related, related to supply chain. Um, he um, very much commended his staff, the food service managers and the team for their ability to be flexible, to be flexible and adaptable, I would say. Um, but they are facing some issues that I think are part of the pandemic and just kind of uh, uh, district, if not state or if not countrywide. Um, they are working with some uh, flexibility related to menu options, but they are keeping, sh being mindful of equitable menu options for all staff, whether it's um, food sensitivity issues, allergy issues, and things like that, but they are doing their best to diversify the menu. Um, so um, it's a challenge, but they are doing the best they can. And he, uh, again, to reiterate, gave his, his team uh, 
a lot of praise and admiration for their efforts they are putting forth. Uh, related to transportation, um, myself, um, Cindy Crowley, and uh, Lisa Edinburgh are, are joining uh, join us when we talk to NRT. We are um, working with them to help reassess routes, um, mapping, um, making sure that the um, any issues that they face are not kind of specific to one area, demographic, or anything like that. We want to make sure that um, transportation issues and struggles, um, while we're doing our best to monitor them and reduce them, that we are not focusing specifically on one area of town or one specific group of people. We want to make sure that um, the challenge, even though it, it's a little odd to say, is is, is spread equitably, if that's, if that's fair. Um, they are doing their reassessment. It's usually at this point in the school year that they kind of get a better count, a head count number and kind of really reassess routes and things like that. So we should hear within the next two weeks as to any rerouting or, or updates they're going to do to that. Um, and I will be, keep the school committee appraised of that. Um, thus far, they're doing the best they can um, with some, I, I would call it more um, uh, small adjustments or bleeps on their, uh, on, on their routes, but they're doing the best they can. And our relationship continues to be strong with them. And we're waiting as well. I mean, our best advantage would be for them to complete the half route that we have the morning bus run for, but not the afternoon. So we really still need an additional driver to take the afternoon of the second half of that route is really where we, we definitely have a deficit in capacity. So um, hopefully that would be then even the longer term solution, but it is really difficult this time of year, as Dave's saying, for us to every year balance routes now that we've run them long enough to start to see the stabilization. So that seems good. Yep. And the goal is to get everyone to school on time and out of school on time <laughs> and home in right. a timely manner. So, yep, thank you. Thank you for all your efforts on that. And that's great to hear that this is a continued positive relationship with NRT and you know they work really well with us. So that's great. Thank you. Um, Andrew, do you have some updates? Yeah, so... Uh, generally, at the high school, we're continuing to uh, develop solid, productive um, academic routines as well as trying to adjust and find the right pacing for the new year. Um, last Friday, we ha just had picture day, and this Friday, in addition to being a half day, we're also going to have our homecoming dance. Um, and for, from what I've seen so far, it's, um, it's going to be a pretty exciting and big event <laughs> that a lot of people are going to attend. Um, this week has also been Spirit, uh, Spirit Week at the high school, and Saturday there will be the homecoming festival, uh, followed by the homecoming football match, which will be uh, really exciting. Um, uh, WHS is also hosting another author visit uh, Tuesday. Uh, Kim Johnson will be giving a 45-minute talk on her book, This is, America, this is My America. And at Gibbons, um, there were some teachers who commented that students um, were displaying some difficulties with uh, their maturity and social development, which um, seems to be lagging one year behind what it usually is. So um, I'd recommend um, placing a focus on that for the future. And um, in the coming weeks at Gibbons, they'll, um, they'll be introducing their social-emotional learning curriculum, which will try to address this problem in the future. And then at Hastings, um, the first graders just went on their first field trip to uh, a local farm and also had a Zoom call with a local meteorologist, which um, was connected to their recent units in science. And yeah, that's all I have to report today. Yeah, and um, the homecoming festival on Saturday is open to the Yes, to it's the open public. to everyone, okay, so great. please come by. Yep, and that is 1130 yes. to 1, I, one or 11 to 130, something yes, like that. Yes, and then the football yeah. game will be at 1. And the football, okay, the football game's right after. Great, yeah, that's exciting. And I'm glad to hear that field trips are back. That's one yes. more, like, step towards a more typical uh, school year experience. Thank you. Yeah, and I think for, Andrew, are you going to be doing the young student activities and things? Will Stuco be hosting 
games and things like they have in the past for, at the homecoming festival yeah. yes yeah. there will be so a I think if, house. for people that haven't if you're a young family in town or a new family to town, um, that's just a great event to come up to and you can have your little one age three and up. I mean, really, as long as they're old enough to pitch a, a game, you know, activity, they can participate. There's face painting and it's really fun and, and festive. And so all, of, all run by the student council groups and different leadership organizations and there's are you doing the mini auction with the baskets yes there's a small auction with the baskets where you can bid on things it's really quite festive and a fun place to take your family on saturday and so i encourage everyone to attend it's outside it looks like the weather will be beautiful um, it's been a long time coming back so we're excited to have it yeah i'm excited to have our community meet all our amazing high schoolers and just have fun yeah, and the football game is at one o'clock. Yes. Great, thanks. Sarah, what do you have tonight? Um, first, I just wanna thank um, everyone who came out for town meeting on Monday and always thank John Arnold for running a very efficient meeting. Um, he is very well prepared and it makes it very smooth for everyone, everyone there. So thank you to him and um, our articles passed so um, we can go ahead and get our SEL coordinator and um, get another employee for our business office. So thank you to everyone who came out and voted. Um, also, I want to put in a little plug for the Turkey Trot, which is Saturday, November 20th, um, the Saturday before Thanksgiving at 9 a.m. There is a this 5K walk, run, or trot, whatever, however you make it around, or just come hang out. <laughs> um, and supply chain issues, I've ordered hundreds of shirts already, which I don't usually do, but they told me I wouldn't get them, so sign up. You'll get a shirt for sure. Um, <laughs> I was going to ask about the shirt deadline because that's usually what gets it's me. It's November 1st, okay. but I ordered um, <laughs> thousands of shirts. No, I ordered <laughs> make it just under the deadline. about 900 shirts. All right. So with plenty of shirts to go around, but I need you to sign up. I will sign up. Yeah. So thank you. I got it. Um, and a, you get a shirt and a morning of fun community fitness and wellness. Yep. Thank you. That's a fun Rafael, do you have anything? You have something to share, right? Yeah, um, so this was shared by Tim Kohler, uh, who's part of Sustainability Westboro, and which I'm a part of it too. So uh, Mass Save uh, sponsors workshops through a nonprofit called NEED. Um, it's N-E-E-D dot org. And this coming Saturday, um, October 23rd, I know this homecoming, but um, <laughs> <laughs> there's a workshop for energy education workshop uh, for teachers. And uh, it's a, they provide a science of energy kit uh, or an energy management kit. Uh, there's a $100 stipend for, uh, it's, it's, it's catered towards teachers. Um, they, they talk about the forms of energy, uh, different sources of energy contributing to the generation of ele electricity within Massachusetts, um, and how do you use energy in daily life at school, um, energy consumption steps that teachers and students can take to reduce energy at home and at school. So it's a great workshop. Uh, the thinking behind it is uh, for it's the train the trainer kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So if they train the teachers, they could impart that knowledge back to the students. And unless, uh, I mean, we didn't do much about climate change, so it's, it's up to the next generation, the kids who are coming out of school, so we should do something about it. Mm -hmm. And the more trained they are about these topics, about energy, energy consumptions, it will only help them do the right thing, so that's. We'll that's definitely right. share it out. I know you sent the link to Daniel, so. I we'll, sent the link, good. yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, with the Red Sox game going, I don't know how many, <laughs> how many people are watching. <laughs> so it's better, it's, it would be good. Is it in person everybody. or is it Zoom? I don't remember. It's Zoom. Okay. Yeah. So good, thank you. Thanks for the, passing on the resource. No, that's thank great. you. Yeah, for, yeah. yeah. thanks. Lisa. So um, I know that I give a bus up app update each time and it seems like it's a little delayed each time and it is. <laughs> um, 
the developer of the app. Uh, it's, it's the, I guess I've never mentioned it, but it's called Where's My Kid? <laughs> and um, <laughs> that's the name of the app. And last, uh, I think it was a week ago Friday, uh, Sarah and I demoed it and did not go very well until the couldn't, following Couldn't week. find my kids. Couldn't, couldn't <laughs> find her kids. I uh, couldn't find Any the buses. <laughs> good. So it does seem to have a few glitches when you sign up. It takes, you know, 24 hours for it to load up. Um, and it is delayed again because we're having a few uh, issues with um, how parents will put in their student, their, their child's IDs, ID numbers. The way it's set up, it's a little more challenging than the system that we have in Westboro Public Schools. But at the same time, while we're figuring that out, um, we're discovering more and more about the app. Uh, I don't know if Sarah thought it, it was running pretty smoothly um, after we were up and running, where you can really get correct alerts, accurate, um, the refresh time is you can set to 15 seconds and it's pretty accurate and you can actually see the little icon moving along and you can set up uh, radius uh, notifications. So if you wanted to have like a three minute gap between the time the bus arrives in front of your stop, it's actually very, very accurate. And I, we didn't see that with our last app. And one of its issues is that you will see the notifications come on every time that bus hits through the radius of your home, which can happen in three different routes. So it can be the Mill Pond bus, it can be the middle school, high school, high school bus, and then it can be the elementary school bus. So those are some of the issues. Um, it is also only on the app, it's only in English and Spanish. That's one of its limitations. But it's a very visual app, so it is very user friendly, so that may not be an issue. But the instructions for setting it up will be in the languages that we have translated in our system. We've asked them to put that into translation, and we should have those. And that, so do we have a date for when we're starting? We do not. But I'm hoping that our goal is to have it in before it gets too cold, which is usually when people start using the app. Mm. Yeah, I think yeah. that's a reasonable target. I mean, again, I, I think you've done a great job to move it forward. And once we'd rather do it right and have the kinks ironed out and have it go smoothly when we do it. So I think once we get started, we get a long term benefit, which is nice. Right, right. So eventually we'll know where's my kid. <laughs> <laughs> I love the name. I like that they had me at the name. I like that one. No, I agree. It's very user friendly. And like you said, it's very visual. Like after, once you get the buses on there, you can just look and see a little bus icon, which the other one didn't have. Right. Um, so you can like see it moving down the street and up the street. So. And it's considerably more accurate. It is. That I agree. Is That's exciting. So I mean, I think we'll end up in a better place yeah. Yeah. again. In yeah, fact, it's literally, it's there when the bus is outside my house. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, there's a bus. Oh, yeah. There's the and does it tell exciting. you when the bus has arrived at the school? Does it yes. get a so you set up your points where you want it to notify you. So you oh, would okay. put in, you know, Gibbons Middle School or Hastings. And so if you have more than one child, you can put in those, even if it's a different numbered bus. And of course, one of the snafus is if your bus is a spare bus that day, it, it, you know, just like in the past, because it's use, using GPS, um, that is a slight problem. That's true, because well. I did watch my bus go up 495 one day. <laughs> Her bus was using well, a spare. <laughs> and, and by the way, it was using a spare not because the original bus yes. had a problem. That's why she could see her actual bus yeah, moving was, up 495, because it was not a problem. Yeah, well, it's a business. It's functioning very well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a very complex business. Uh, you know, yeah, I think it's... Yeah. And testing it was a great idea, and now we have even more information to make it more accurate and user-friendly. So thank you. Thanks. Steve? Um, I can do um, building project building updates. updates, if you'd like. Yeah, sure. The only thing I was going to say is thank you to the residents and town employees who attended town meetings. So Sarah took care of that, and so you're on. Thank you. <laughs> Since most of my focus is at fails, that's what I'll speak to and just mention a little bit about Hastings when I, we get done. Um, as you know, we hope our certificate of occupancy is going to be uh, November the 10th with um, the move to start on the uh, on the 11th and thereafter. Um, and so, as you might anticipate, with those kind of dates that close, I can give you an update on many things. 
Uh, finishes in the building are nearly done. Um, the flooring in particular, as well as the walls and ceilings and in all the classrooms. So the final finish uh, working is the flooring going up the stairs in the main entrance to the school. Everything else is done relative to flooring. Um, there have been some questions. What are we going to do as the school uh, system in regards to the old furniture? It fails. We have attempted for over a year to try to find somebody who would take the furniture since it does have some merit um, in terms of it, although it's old and somewhat beat up, um, it still is useful, otherwise we wouldn't have it there. So we, we attempted to put it up for sale uh, and that didn't work because of the complications of the state bid laws. Uh, we tried to find users who would take it um, and we would load it into their trucks um, to take it away and that didn't work. We also contacted uh, West Virginia um, uh, Department of Education to see if they would have an interest in it. As you may recall earlier projects, we were able to donate um, some school furniture to West Virginia. Uh, they declined and so at this point contractually uh, it will be disposed of by the contractor and any other system or process that we had would have cost the town money. And so that's why it is ending up that way. Um, but the project uh, made uh, valiant attempts in different ways to try to find people who could benefit from that furniture. Um, the uh, solar panel wiring is nearly complete. We're waiting for one last fitting that has been on order for months, but we do finally anticipate that we'll receive that by the end of this week or early next, which would allow us then to complete the wiring on the solar panel system. All the internal stuff is already in place, and so that would allow us then to begin to check that out. Uh, one of the outcomes of this particular effort in regards to solar is to, uh, for the town to benefit from any excess generation that we would have. In recent uh, months, uh, we uh, were offered, I guess, the opportunity to go e either way on two contracts with National Grid, for which one of them, uh, our uh, solar consultant, has been asked to come and deliver to us the details of what each one of these contracts mean um, and obviously until we know what our options are and based on the performance of the system to generate as well as um, the national grids um, uh, utility rates, uh, we don't want to make the wrong decision and cost the town money. So we have a meeting set up with our solar uh, consultant uh, next week to discuss the details of each one of those options. You can ask me questions afterwards if you'd like. Um, the geothermal system is functional and currently it is heating the building. Uh, we are still working out some bugs in that system, um, but the majority of, this, uh, of the water circuits that go to the wells, you may recall that our original effort was to install 40 600 feet deep wells on site that um, basically take the heat from the earth and it provides the opportunity for heat pumps within the building to remove that heat to heat the building. And at this point, um, we, we do have enough circuits operating so we can heat the building. We'll be doing the um, standby boiler um, tests shortly, um, and uh, which will also function in parallel with the um, geothermal heating system if necessary as a final booster if it happens to be too cold. Uh, alternatively, if we lose the, the geothermal system for any reason in the winter, um, the uh, standby boiler will be able to heat the building, probably not as warm as we would like, but at least to maintain the building heat so that uh, we don't have issues of, associated with uh, cold spaces or cold rooms. Uh, we have seeded the grass in many places around the building, particularly uh, for those who have seen the nice grass. As a matter of fact, it was mowed today, and that's the, the space uh, on the Eli Whitney side of the old parking lot. Uh, meanwhile, grass has been uh, seeded using hydro seeding on the north and west and south of the, uh, of the new building, as well as, as I said, at the old parking lot. 
um, office trailers that were to the uh, west of the site near the top of the site are now empty and they will be moved from the site shortly uh, hopefully by the end of the week but if not by early next week and uh, because the building is is rapidly coming to completion of at least the physical work in the building um, paperwork submittals are in process with all the various town departments who receive um, information associated with the completeness of the building, which includes the DPW, the building department, um, and other uh, building, uh, excuse me, other departments in the town. Uh, as I mentioned when I started this, we are anticipating a, a certificate of building op occupancy on November the 10th. Uh, but there's a lot of things to get uh, in place and provided to the departments because until we're complete, um, we're hopeful, but we don't have a building certificate yet. And um, testing of nearly all the systems in the building are underway, and uh, there are a punch list uh, of, of completing things like um, maybe missing paint, uh, paint in some areas or other things that happen as you're moving furniture in and out. And by the way, nearly all the furniture that was needed for the school has been delivered with a final delivery of furniture um, next week. Uh, and so, um, you know, it's getting quite exciting and also nerve wracking because a lot of little pieces are going to have to come together um, before we can do all these different things that I mentioned in this list. So the, uh, the one that's not anywhere near as exciting as fails is the sprinkler system at Hastings. And it's coming along quite well now uh, with some, I guess, glitches in the beginning that uh, certain people uh, around here have taken care of. And um, uh, at this point, they're on schedule uh, with the design the way we want it. And uh, so that's my report for this time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer. Questions? I walked the building um, Tuesday or Wednesday, did an extensive walkthrough, and um, I would echo the majority of what Steve is saying. You can see the completion rate coming together and substantial progress. Um, they have a lot of workers in the space, which is usually indicative of things moving in the right direction, and they couldn't point out anything that they were waiting for that should hang us up. It's a matter of timing. As you said, there were people cleaning, furniture's being assembled and put together, and, and so you're kind of moving into that finishing stage. One of the nice pieces about this building that I think people won't realize is that with, that, with the geothermal system, it's silent. Like you, in classrooms, it's very, like the blower systems that, that move through buildings to provide heating and cooling and circulation of air. We have very good air circulation in this district and strong HVAC, as you know, from, from our work during COVID. But what's really interesting, and, and this is um, not true, the system's a little different at um, Hastings, just the sophistication of a geothermal system and then where it is now, um, it's amazing, it's quiet. And um, so there's things like that that are just gonna be a real joy about the space. Um, and I'm pleased with how it's coming together. I wanna give a shout out to uh, Mary Ann Standard, the principal who's just doing an amazing job to coordinate transition. Where I was meeting with her before uh, this meeting to discuss, we'll be making some videos to provide for families and students on the transition of the opening day on the 15th. We have closure activities, well-planned, laid out, staffed kind of coverages in place seamlessly so that teachers can receive time to pack and organize while students are, again, there's two half days um, that are a piece of this and I wanna thank our FAILS families for um, allowing that and recognizing that it's a compromise that, that we hate to have to make, but recognizing that the Yeoman's work to get open, I want to say the Vales faculty has done an amazing job. So behind the scenes, there's a tremendous amount, not just on the construction side, but on the planning and organizational side from the Vales team, the custodial team, uh, the cafeteria staff preparing to manage in a new space. All of that is going very well. Um, and those two pieces have to converge to get us to get us open. So exciting things ahead, but exceptionally busy for the next three weeks. 
And I'd like to remind everyone about the That's fails memory yeah. stroll on Saturday. Um, oh, sorry, on Sunday okay. from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, the fails elementary school will be open for anyone to walk through and visit and Current. take your final photos and say goodbye. And <laughs> um, so uh, the community is welcome to come down and um, take a look and pay your respects to <laughs> the old fails and take a look at the new building. Um, on site. I walked by there today and just from the outside there was a flurry of activity planting trees and things being loaded in and out of the building and that's exciting. It's really exciting. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for Steve about hastings or fails? I guess one other thing that everybody should be interested in is where are we on the budget? We still think we're on budget. Uh, we don't have an awful lot of contingency left, um, but we do have some, and contingencies are contingent on things that come and go bump in the night, and there's still an opportunity for that to happen. But um, it's been a real struggle through this particular project, more so than any other, uh, because of COVID and the things that have happened with construction issues, the delivery of equipment, delivery of uh, and availability of different things, I mean, one of the things that we ran into recently, which nobody ever remembers, is the availability of paint, mm -hmm. you know, um, and particular colors of paint. Mm -hmm. And of course, in you know, in, in the school system that we have here, uh, we try and, and some of the decor is quite bright stuff, and it hasn't been that easy to find things like that. So it's been a struggle. And again, I'll, I'll also um, trumpet Marianne's efforts uh, without griping, um, it's been a tremendous concern, if you will, to pay attention to detail. And the detail, of course, from the administration point of view of, of making sure that all the things that have to come together in order, in time, is being handled by Mary Ann. And, and um, somehow it seems to work out. Um, so, so in time, perhaps we can reward her efforts as we have others you know, who have stepped up to the needs of, of not only her job, but, you know, the fact that um, that's been her school and, and, and her interest to make it come out right, uh, even to the last detail. So, again, thanks to Marianne. All right, um, we're going to move on to citizens' requests. Um, first, I'd like to know if there's anyone here tonight who wishes to come forward to make a statement to the school committee. Um, seeing none, I do have a um, written uh, school committee message uh, to be read into the public record from a resident. Um, this is from Farah Aldrin, 214 West Main Street. This is a message that she has asked me to read on her behalf to the school committee. I do not provide consent for wearing a mask for myself or my family. Therefore, I will not appear to read my statement as a form of civil disobedience against masking. The only reason our children are in a mask is because we are being coerced with a loss of their education. Studies have found that masking provides next to no protection against a virus that is spread as an aerosol. Masks reduce amounts of oxygen and increase carbon dioxide in people's bodies, and that can cause irreparable brain damage, an environment where cancer grows, and many other physical ailments, bacterial pneumonia, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, loss of taste or smell, muscle aches or body aches, skin infections, dental deformities, etc. Coincidentally, many of these symptoms are COVID symptoms. COVID is almost 100% survivable, our town is nearly fully vaccinated, and most studies have found that children are at nearly no risk from COVID. Natural immunity is much more effective than the vaccine. We should use COVID relief funds to roll out a mass testing for natural immunity among the student population to determine if we have already reached herd immunity in the schools. Your plan to unmask children based on vaccination status will compound the emotional damage that has already been inflicted through masking. The policy will encourage bullying and isolation and coerce children through the incentive of not wearing a mask to get a vaccine. That may cause adverse events such as death, 
blood clots, irreparable heart inflammation, Guillain-Barre syndrome, and stroke. Sadly, this isn't even the, the entire list of adverse reactions, and we still have zero long-term studies on fertility, birth defects, or cancers caused from these experimental emergency use vaccines, once again for a disease that is close to 100% survivable. If you require written informed consent for the experimental medical treatment, emergency use authorization only, test and stay program, then you surely must need written informed consent to mask our children. Masking is an experimental medical treatment, emergency use authorization only, and quite possibly the world's largest sociological and psychological experiment of all time. To affirm, I do not consent to you masking my children, the coercive tactics being used to obtain an education, or the experimental medical treatments. Thank you. And that was a school committee message for the public record from Farah Aldrin, 214 West Main Street. So typically we do not respond to citizens' requests, but I do want to go on public record to say that I believe there's a lot of misinformation uh, shared in that public statement. Can I add a comment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, please note that this is one person's opinion with no scientific backing for what she has mentioned in her comments. All right. Um, I appreciate that this person has reached out to us. We always welcome anyone in the community who has thoughts to share with the school committee to come forward and do that. So thank you to her for sending that message. We will move on to an approval of the superintendent's goals, which we looked at at our last meeting. Thank you. I'll let Daniel open them up. Um, I think you had time to look at them, and I, my understanding is that you're comfortable with them as they're presented. And um, you know, I'm I'm looking forward to moving forward on them. We went through them at the last meeting, and I'll just highlight that they focus on the areas of standard of evaluation for superintendents. There's an overarching goal focus centered on continuing to manage the impacts and final stages of COVID-19 as we steer the district through this year ahead. I want to then acknowledge that instructional leadership will focus on the long-range strategic plan development. And if you want to scroll down just a little bit, Daniel, um, that will take a good amount of work to shepherd forward the completion of that and the implementation of year one. And you've got some benchmark dates. Uh, we will look at continuing to focus on our DEI practices. You see that we've refined doing targeted sharing for you so that the public gets a stranded ongoing set of updates in some of these key areas and the implementation of our DEI team and the robust work with our uh, consultant. Management and operations certainly fails, continues and will continue to be over the next year, really important. Um, the enjoyment of training and onboarding new colleagues at uh, the cabinet level with a work of looking at training for PD and use of munis. Um, if you scroll down. Again, um, family and community engagement, really trying to focus on returning to the stabilization of all the core events that are part of um, the way that we choose to implement schooling here. Robust work of Daniel and I to be on the ground at building level, keeping our supervision strong, working with the leadership team, um, being present, plugging back into the culture of the community, all of those are areas that require time and energy, and I will be really trying to center on achieving those pieces. Uh, and those will be my goals for the year. You'll get uh, usually a mid-year report and then uh, an end-of-year summative from me on kind of general assessment of my targeted goals. And I look forward to you not waiting till the end of the year. You can give me feedback and direction as we move through those. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the goals that Amber shared? I just appreciate, um, you know, I, w watching you behind the scenes work with staff and, and teachers, there's a high degree of expectation for high quality in our district, and you expect no less from yourself. And I always appreciate that parallel that exists. 
that you expect from yourself high, high achievement to you know, support an extraordinary school district such as Westboro. So thank you. I appreciate what you, the work you do and the, the fact that you set, you set your goals high. It's thank appreciated. You. Yeah. Well, keep us busy. Yeah. <laughs> you probably just need a motion to approve. Sure. Um, is there a motion to approve the superintendent's goals? So move. Second. I'll second. Thank you, Sarah. Any other questions or discussion? All in favor? Aye. Five zero uh, approval of the superintendent's goals. Thank you very much. So one of the things um, to look to our next agenda item as we look at a return towards normalcy is really anchoring the school committee with a set of core reports as you move through the year so that you have an opportunity to meet with the varied leadership and colleagues across the district who are implementing the targeted goals that you see in the strategic plan and that are then carried through for budgeting and then all for the service of students. And so when you see reports brought back to you, the purpose is to give you all of the robust talking points that you need to represent the implementation of our budget and our programming across this community to serve our students. So I'm pleased tonight that one of the first updates I, I wanted to bring was to have um, Aaron, come and present on the Borough Sugar Shack. I think there's been a lot going on over there. She wanted to provide an update for you on um, how things are going. Welcome, Aaron. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me back to talk about the borough. I always love talking about the borough. <laughs> Aaron knows me. Um, again, for anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Aaron LaPrade, Borough Coordinator. Um, it has been a busy start to this school year. Back in July, at the start of our extended school year, we were fortunate to welcome a new teacher, Angelina McCarthy, formerly Angelina Corzini. Angelina has actually returned to our district. She had been a teacher at the high school previously, notably leading the Best Buddies program to national recognition as chapter of the year in 2017. She's a DESE-endorsed transition specialist who brings significant knowledge and expertise to her role as teacher for the borough and therefore improves our, our, our ability to provide our students with good, strong transition programming. Also the fact that she was able to start right away, teach our summer program, and that she came to the role holding so much historical knowledge of the district and our students meant that we were able to just hit the ground running um, as we continue to move forward with current programming and several new initiatives. Our leadership team now, consisting of Angelina, our Sugar Shack manager, Kristen Dada-Wall, our special ed coordinator, Karen Bunton, and myself, is a dynamic, talented, and caring force that gels in such a way that we have already made tremendous progress toward our overall program goals in just a short time. Our mindset is really one of continuous improvement, not only in the way we're able to carry out daily functions and operations, but more importantly, in the way we're able to make our students' experience at the borough more meaningful and more fulfilling. We're constantly evaluating and assessing, looking for ways to improve communication and existing procedures or better utilize our physical space, determining where new processes are needed to streamline our operations. Oops, sorry, I should have clicked ahead here. There we go. Um, new evidence. Um, where am I? Uh, we always evaluate our operations through a student-centric lens in an effort to bring as many benefits and new opportunities to our students as possible, while also improving workflow for staff. For example, we've worked to streamline how projects and tasks filter through the Sugar Shack by better utilizing a central dry erase board to outline project steps, and also improving the way our backstock is labeled in order to make everything much more accessible and enable students to be more independent in carrying out the tasks. We've also created a new system of job site student evaluations, both, both for Sugar Shack and our offsite jobs, that will significantly aid data collection, improve analytics, and will provide a more user-friendly experience for our, our, our staff and off-site supervisors. I'll make sure, there we go. There we go, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Activities and, and engagement. Our students have been incredibly busy with new experiences and community engagement this summer and fall, in addition to all the work that they've been doing in the classroom and at their job sites. This summer, they were able to volunteer at Community Harvest Project in North Grafton, which is a nonprofit farm that grows fruits and vegetables for hunger relief. And also this fall, they've been volunteering at Westboro Food Pantry. 
They've had community outings to Hopkinton State Park and Lake Chauncey with peers from other districts, have hosted friends at social events such as board game and ice cream night and borough karaoke night, which I have to say we have a student who sounds just like Johnny Cash. <laughs> it was awesome. Just I saw awesome. some of the videos posted oh, on my, Facebook. Yeah, they were amazing. Right, <laughs> anyone watching, go to the, the uh, Sugar Shack and Borough Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. Um, and they've also hosted an informational table at the Westboro Block Party, which was held in August. And this is just a snapshot of their busy social agenda. Their, their dance card is definitely full. <laughs> Other highlights of their education in the classroom include cooking classes taught by Mr. Perryman from the high school. They've been learning to use the WRTA's VIA service, which is like Lyft or Uber, um, to build travel training skills and work toward independence and getting around town into their offsite jobs. That's been a great addition to our tools that we have. And they participated in many health and fitness activities such as walking club, adaptive PE, and yoga. And our exciting news as of this week is that we'll also be purchasing a group membership at the YMCA, courtesy of a very generous donor. There's some pictures. Um, that's some from Community Harvest, from um, Hopkinton State Park. And then that's our new Sugar Shack tent there at, um, at the block party. I that love was, that, that thing. Was I love it. <laughs> it is pretty cool. We like to make the distinction that we're not necessarily teaching students to work in a candy store when they're working at the Sugar Shack. Rather, we're teaching them those fundamental work skills that will translate to whatever job they wish to pursue as part of their future vision for themselves. So this fall, we've had students at a number of individualized off-site placements where they're able to apply those skills that they've learned in the Sugar Shack. At least two of the internships that you see listed here are very likely to lead to paid positions with natural support provided by the employer following the student's time at the borough, which of course is one of the primary goals of our program. We also have five students currently working in the Sugar Shack after school and on weekends as full Westboro Public Schools employees and we'll be onboarding our newest students in the coming weeks. Awesome. Pictures of our students at work. One of our most important priorities has been to improve the guidance that we're able to offer to students and their families regarding how working will impact their social security benefits. Recently, we took an enormous leap toward that goal by initiating a partnership with the Work Without Limits program. Work Without Limits is a statewide network of engaged employers and collaborative community partners like us that aims to increase employment outcomes among individuals with, individuals with disabilities. As one of these community partners, the borough gains access to a business network full of employers who are passionate about hiring people with disabilities. One tool that we'll be able to use to connect with these employers is an exclusive LinkedIn jobs board where students can practice looking for jobs and responding to opportunities. The Work Without Limits partnership fulfills our benefits goals as well, as the program will provide the borough with a dedicated benefits specialist who will be able to provide comprehensive benefits reviews and counseling to our students and families on an ongoing basis. This was the feature that really drew me to the Work Without Limits program. And as I mentioned, the benefits piece has been one of our most pressing needs, so it's, it's, um, it, it really was a godsend to find it. Furthermore, we've also been exploring the opportunity to partner with Work Without Limits in the Ticket to Work program. Ticket to Work is a Social Security Administration program that supports career development for beneficiaries and helps people with disabilities progress toward financial independence. In the proposed partnership, the borough would refer students and alumni who have a high likelihood of securing long-term paid employment to Work Without Limits, who would then step in to provide ongoing benefits counseling to help them progressively work and earn more while navigating their benefits, and eventually enabling them to be financially independent. It's so overwhelming for students and their families to navigate SSI and SSDI um, as they relate to how much they can work and how much they're allowed to earn by working. This program clears up all of that for them and will provide lasting guidance and support to these individuals throughout their careers and throughout any life changes that may occur along the way. And as an added bonus, the Social Security Administration encourages referring agencies to participate in the Ticket to Work program by paying out incentive payments as referred individuals reach various earning milestones. As a partner of Work Without Limits, the borough program would be entitled to receive 50% of any payments paid out by the Social Security Administration for as long as the individual is part of the Ticket to Work program, even if it's many years after, leading, after aging out of the borough. So we're still in the, the vetting stage of this proposal, so we'll have more to come 
on that eventually, we hope. We've also been fortunate this fall to have weekly pre-employment training services provided to borough students by counselors from the Massachusetts Rehabilitation Commission. This comes in the form of weekly workshops in which students participate in job exploration activities, self-advocacy exercises, and other group work to reinforce their employment skills. Other recent, recent initiatives include taking steps to increase collaboration between the borough and high school special ed staff in order to better facilitate smooth handoff of rising students to the borough. We began this effort last spring, actually, with high school staff accompanying um, our rising students to the borough on Fridays in order to acclimate, acclimate them to the new surroundings and give our borough staff a chance to get to know them, work with them. And going forward, we'll continue this practice and then also hold regular meetings with high school staff to compare notes, address questions, and just kind of make sure that all of our ducks are in a row as we welcome new students to the borough. Also, we've been exploring the possibility of offering an inclusive life skills class at the borough that would be available to members of the general community and that would supplement our students' learning. This class would address such areas as personal finance best practices, interviewing and resume writing skills, time management and organization, and all of those workplace soft skills. Such a program would create more opportunity for our students to engage with same age peers, raise the program visibility within the community, teach valuable and badly needed life skills to pre-college and college age young adults of all abilities and create a small additional revenue stream for the program. I've been able to engage members of the community in conversation about this idea as well as leadership from the quarter nine chamber and the response has been extremely favorable. I think there clearly is a need for such a program. So we'll be moving forward with a project plan and hoping to offer a pilot program in collaboration with community ed program in summer of 2022. This is just showcasing some of our new uh, marketing materials. We, we've recently revamped our, our um, program brochure. Nice new fresh look to it. And we revamped the building a little bit. We have some nice new snazzy awnings on the front and a covered awning in the back that actually now has some drapes on the side. So this winter, our students passing in and out um, will be safe from the buildup of ice and whatnot on the back steps. It really looks nice as you drive by, so we're that very grateful great. for the upgrade. Yeah, Beautiful. The awnings out front look great. <laughs> Quick update on the Sugar Shack itself. Um, I've put up a comparison of first quarter sales from the last few fiscal years, um, and you can see there that we've essentially doubled from year to year. Um, and then side by side with total sales by calendar year, going back to 2019, um, put that up just to make the point that in 2021 we're already well ahead of past years and we haven't even included the upcoming holiday season which we expect to be huge we hope <laughs> <laughs> so of course the supply chain issues that were meant that were mentioned they're affecting us too but it's all good um, Kristen the manager just continues to knock it out of the park her her sales savvy and her creativity is just mind-blowing so we're very fortunate to have her some new partnerships at the Sugar Shack. Uh, through a connection that was made at a quarter 9495 networking event, we were able to establish a very fruitful partnership with the Willows and Whitney Place Assisted Living and Retirement Communities. Um, in addition to opportunities to sell our products um, at their stores that they have on site there, um, and also in a corporate capacity, um, which then will generate more work for our students. We've also opened up some channels for students to engage with seniors via volunteer work and some of our social engagements and their social engagements. Likewise, a growing collaboration between the Sugar Shack and the Westboro Council on Aging continues to generate Sugar Shack projects and volunteer opportunities. As we approach Thanksgiving next month, our students will be working to package some sweet treats for our seniors and will aid the Council on Aging in delivering meals to folks across town on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Profile of the Sugar Shack continues to grow thanks in large part to more advanced social media networking and other advertising. We always aim to be very purposeful and targeted in where we place advertisements. Our latest endeavor is advertising in Be Local Metro West magazine, which is a periodical that's exclusively for new residents in the Metro West area. So our ads will appear, in quarter, will appear quarterly in conjunction, conjunction with major retail seasons and will give us the opportunity to sort of catch those new people to the area who are still seeking out the cool places to go. <laughs> um, so we're hoping, we're very confident that that will, uh, that will be fruitful. 
Sugar Shack on the town. Our students have had the opportunity, and of course our students are sort of our best vehicle for advertising um, our mission. Um, they've had the opportunity to work the Sugar Shack table at the weekly farmer's market and movie nights, the block party to help staff our recent borough open house. And they will be at the homecoming game on Saturday operating a table as well. Um, as well as hosting a monster mash for the community during, our, during the downtown trick-or-treating on Tuesday. So please stop by the Sugar Shack, stay and do some dancing. <laughs> Word is continually spreading about the mission of our program. Um, our amazing ta amazingly talented workers and the high quality creative products available at the Sugar Shack. So, and we once again just want to thank the community for the amazing support throughout COVID and beyond. We continue to grow, we continue to build, we grow for the benefit of our students and with them always in mind. Um, as Kristen and the team there develop new products such as our new boo boxes, our crackable pumpkins with sweet treats inside and our upcoming sweets charcuterie board, we always prioritize maximizing student engagement in designing our packaging and in all other aspects of bringing that concept to the sales floor. One last note, we're actively working on upgrading our point of sale system and our online store to accommodate a growing e-commerce um, wing of our operations and to be able to engage in more mobile store operations. Our students love being out and about representing the Sugar Shack, Sugar Shack and the Borough Program, so making sure that we have the proper tools in place to do that um, is of the highest priority. And I just want to mention this picture up on the screen now. That's our student Christopher with our paraeducator Pat McCarthy. Um, Kristen had found down in the, the basement of the borough um, a couple of old displays that had been used uh, at the paint store that had been gathering dust in the basement. She had the idea to bring them up and kind of refurbish them and they would make great additions to the, um, the displays in the Sugar Shack. It's a spinning display. So Christopher is a student who loves carpentry. That's what he wants to do um, f with his life. And Mr. McCarthy um, had a, a business. He, he is a carpenter. So the guys <laughs> took, the, took the display up and refurbished it. And I wish I had to submit my slides before, the, before they were oh, done. And there's actually a great <laughs> video yeah. on both the Sugar Shack Facebook page and the Borough Program um, page. Please check it out, because Christopher, you can see the finished product. And Christopher describes having made it. And it's just. It looks amazing. You yes. should go to the store and see it. It spins, too. Yeah, and it's, it's just, he uh, did a whole little video presentation on it, but beautiful refurbishment, because I Absolutely. saw them before, so I'm pretty, was very <laughs> impressed. It looks great, so nice yeah. stuff. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you so much. We love to Thank hear you. about the borough program, <laughs> and um, I'm so excited to see the data that, you know, the, the, not just the program growing, but the Sugar Shack being successful, um, all the innovative products. I know Sarah's a fan of the Boo Boxes. Yeah, and <laughs> I already got a bunch. <laughs> Those have really taken off. We have people that are coming to the store like, is this where you get the Boo Boxes? So yep. we're doing something right. Yeah, yeah. no, yeah. it's it, we're all busy. So if you don't have time to put together a, a sweet treat for your neighbor, just mm -hmm. go to the Sugar Shack. <laughs> um, and I love the idea of the charcuterie board. And I just... It's, um, I volunteer at the food pantry, and so I see the students volunteering down there, and mm -hmm. they're, they do so much for our community behind the scenes. Um, so it's just a great extension of their time with Westboro Public Schools. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yep, the more, the more we're able to do in the store, and um, this is why Kristen is just so valuable, because she's always coming up with a new idea, that just the more we're able to offer the students, the more skills we're able to introduce to them, and. Um, yeah, we're lucky to have her. Yeah, and that they have like a f full social life there as well with they the do. karaoke nights and game nights. Yeah. And <laughs> I think that that's it's just a one, it's sort of like a community center there at this point. It's great. Yeah. And keep an eye out, we'll be hosting some holiday events coming up. So <laughs> great. I just have to thank you for making, I guess, our dream here on the school committee that in fact this would be successful um, and successful for the kids, particularly. But the fact that economically it looks like it's also a good decision, which means it can grow and it can uh, benefit, you know, kids of the future. Uh, a lot of things being done in this town um, from a school administration and school committee point of view, but this certainly is something that I'm very proud of that we 
had the opportunity with the help of everybody here and yourself and your team to create something that will go forward in the future for the, these kids that really need to have this opportunity, not only now, but for the future of their own careers as they, as they age. So it's wonderful. Thank you for coming. Thank you. We do. We have big plans. So. <laughs> I love them. <laughs> Lisa? Um, I want to thank you. Um, when I look at what you presented today, and I went to visit at the open house in September, the, the upgrade in terms of just seeing the growth ha having happened over the last few years is pretty extraordinary. And then to see, you know, I was looking at the sales numbers and thinking about profit and thinking about, oh, I wonder how profitable, I wonder what the fixed costs are. And I'm thinking of all these business parts of it. And then I thought, <laughs> the profitability of the Borough Sugar Shack is the students and what they become and how they are growing into themselves through this program. And I think about it now, I'm like, was the goal ever, you know, just about revenue and profitability? Yes, wouldn't that be really nice to have a revenue stream? But really, to help our students in the way that you have done is really the profit in the program. And it's so incredible to see kids coming out of the program and finding employment, being part of our community, and just doing so much. So I just, yes, <laughs> you know, yes, the corporate gifts and the boo boxes, yes, all that stuff is really great. But the other part that, you know, sometimes is not fully visible to the outside is really where it's, you know, the most successful. So thank you for changing lives for the better. And that is how we look at it. I mean, the, being profitable is great, but the more profitable we are, that means that we're also, there's just more work, there's more business, there's more, um, more tasks that we can, we can teach our students and skills we can teach them. And I, it, we're just so fortunate to have the Sugar Shack there as part of this program because, you know, it's definitely, it's, a, it's rare. It's if, is there any other? There's no other district that has, and we still have people coming wanting the tours and wanting to find out how it was, how it was done and <laughs> the magic trick was. And so, yeah, so we definitely, the community should be proud of it. It's a great program. And I think it's taken, taken a bit, you know, the store definitely is a startup and the program was sort of a startup and we've been getting the right pieces in place and, and we're there. You know, the team is really strong and only good things to come. And um, all the services that you've been able to put in place for these students and their families in terms of navigating benefits when you're working a job and mm. continuing that connection so it's not like they turn 22 and they exit the program. They can still have this relationship with us and we can support them and their families as they navigate, like, you know, as they grow older in our community. So right. I think that's a really great resource too. And if we do move forward with the ticket to work, that that is such yeah. an appealing aspect of that, that it, it's not that they leave us and, you know, they don't leave us now and that they come back for social events and things like that. But just that idea that that continued support, you know, will, will be there for them as they go through life. That's it's a very comforting part of that that program. Yeah, and you're also supporting their 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 parents and caregivers as they navigate this big transition in life. Mm -hmm. It's a big transition for the entire family, I'm right. sure. So, right. I really hope that works because it's probably the best thing I've heard for these kids as they go forward is an opportunity to have that kind of uh, support, I guess, um, uh, you know, for their future um, because aren't always going to be around. I have to tell you, it really is exciting, and I'm sure you feel it. So thanks. Absolutely. Thank you much. Thank you. Yeah, we will see you, you at the thanks Sugar Shack. Thanks for this. This is, uh, <laughs> can I add? Yeah. this is a great program. I, you know, hats off to you so for pulling this off and, and, and trying to uh, engage Corridor and Chamber is, is such a good idea, such a great idea. I encourage you to keep doing it and they had they have a lot of businesses there who can support us in this endeavor so yeah i think yeah. if we are able to continue to expand our corporate gift capacity now that we can send things via ups and our packaging skills have improved and just our overall capacity and product line are in such a different place so when i look at the work there's a couple pieces which is you know 
we wanted to create a surprise. That's conceptually part of what we wanted, was a vibrant program that provided robust learning for a fabulous group of our students who needed more time in our, in our relationship. And at the same time, we wanted to give back to Westboro because the rotary, the downtown feel, the picture of a store that's a stopping place that has programs, as you said, is starting to feel like a community space um, and is a high quality store in town. And I think when people come in, there's that little pop of surprise where they're like, oh my gosh, your products are amazing. Your stuff's gorgeous um, and it's unique. It's one of a kind. There's one of a kind product lines in there. We have clothing products lines related to Westboro. We wanted people to have that little aha when they come in and I think we're getting there. Um, the trajectory of the work isn't unlike the trajectory of a teacher when they join us where we see year one, two, and three. Like, and by year three, when they get you know, PTS with us, there's the depth and the underpinnings and the quality where you start to see how it all comes together. It just gets more robust, it gets more grounded. That's what you see happening with this programming. And I think, you know, I wanna give a shout out to Dr. Sherry Stevens, it's her vision and her passion to have implemented this. And, um, you know, she is still very close on the management of all of it. And I just spend a lot of money in there to try to do my part, um, but we really enjoy it. So again, the, the opportunity of a quality program presentation to you gives you good talking points, shows you our budget at play, and I look forward to good things ahead. So. Thank you, Thank so, you much so much for, for joining us tonight. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Come if you have a monster mash, store, <laughs> yep. you know it's definitely it's share and encourage your friends to go and see it. And um, you know there's there's a lot of fun stuff in there. It's a great place for gift giving. You know, and I know we're approaching some holiday seasons, and it's a great place to go. I go in. I need this. I need that. And I'll, I walk out with the gifts all ready to go. It's it's well, great. The, the look of surprise you mentioned, Amber, is. When people yeah. people walk in, and yeah, it's it, very they really funny. do, and kids to see kids' eyes just are enormous. Yeah. It's it's awesome. It yeah, really it's is. fun stuff. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Have a good night. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> display. Yeah, and fo you can follow the Sugar Shack and the Borough Program on Facebook, where they post lots of videos of not just the students in action, but also. Um, products and different things that they're featuring there and events and stuff like that. And on so. Instagram as well. Their Instagram feed is excellent. Yeah. Um, and I think the next big task will be the updating of the website to really echo, I mean, we kind of outgrew it in that sense. We the, the help we got to get that thing set up was amazing. And now we're working with that same team to vision an upgrade that, that really captures a, a high-end website that can push product more. It's exciting. Thank you. Thanks. And um, I just want to say it's nice to get back to these types of presentations. We put them on hold last year because for a number of reasons, um, but our meetings were taken up with a lot of um, COVID work and asking our staff to come forward and do a presentation like this, is, it's a big ask. They put a lot of time and effort into the preparation and I missed them and I'm glad that we're gonna have some of them back this year. So. I have to remember every year we graduate hundreds of families and we bring in hundreds of new families. Yep. And they all need opportunities to hear and see those reports. So then when we push those out afterwards, it just keeps that continuity of knowledge in your district. Yeah, and things are always changing and growing. So the borough program that we heard of a few years ago is not the borough program that we have now. So the updates are really important. So thank you. All right. Um, now we will move on to our budget presentation number one. <laughs> and I decided it would be a good idea this year in our agenda to number our budget presentation. So um, Dave, you shared with us a schedule for you know, when we'll have certain presentations and decision making happening with the budget. And I just think this will help all of us kind of keep track of where we are navigating that um, schedule. So I'm gonna turn it over to Daniel who has the presentation for tonight. Um, Amber, do you want to give the context in terms of the timing of the overall budget? I mean, that's sure. If you want to, uh, traditionally, this, put that one slide we always here. begin with thank you, an opportunity for David and I. This is uh, the timeline presented by the Director of Finance for the implementation of our budget. It shows you that we start this process early 
in September to give you this timeline and then we are off and running. So you see that in the last couple of weeks, he's uh, the director of finance, Dave's busy working on the cost centers, uh, teachers are, I mean, um, principals are thinking about their budgets and we dive in. So from there we move into uh, mid-October, a range of discussions and you see tonight your first budget presentation on enrollment. And then from this presentation, um, we move into an overview of the core pieces of the budgeting that you'll see, and that would come to you on November 2nd. And then on November 17th, you really see your, your largest overarching budget presentation that provides the framework of a look at kind of how all the moving pieces are coming together. And then um, we move towards the final recommendations evolving on December 1st. And then you can see there's a two week window for reflection questions and additional um, calculations work and changes before we come together for that final presentation moving towards a vote on December 15th and then it needs to be sent across the street to the selectmen and the town finance committee following by the deadline according to the charter by December 23rd. So um, David and I, we say it's speed budgeting, um, <laughs> but I think we've made some nice changes to the way we approach it and we look forward to bringing forward to you the large working pieces of the budget before you see the final in that mid-November. Okay, um, and so uh, I'll, I'm gonna give you an overview of the enrollment and traditionally we start with enrollment because, well, the last several, you know, for a long period of time, over eight or so years, the enrollment was going up steadily in the district. We used to be 3,500 students um, and we are up towards 4,000 and so the enrollment number was an important indicator of like, where we might be going in terms of our budget requests, in terms of needing additional staff to handle additional students. And you can see over the last, this first slide on enrollment <clears throat> has showed that um, we've been f fairly, I mean, there's the, the, it sort of leveled off for a year where it was flat at a negative, we, we went up negative one between 17 and um, 17, 18, 18, 19. And then we were still on an upward tra trajectory in 1920. And then with the COVID, um, there was a big uh, withdrawal of students and homeschooling and the numbers went down substantially and then bounced back up um, so that we're currently up 77 over last year. Um, we still have um, sort of double the number of homeschool students we traditionally have, so we could expect next year to, to even though I have a question mark in terms of the change, um, there, there will likely be, you know, at least that influx from the homeschooling front, but we never really know from year to year. Um, uh, what the growth is going to be like. The, the, off, the most unknown numbers are kindergarten number, um, the kindergarten fluctuation. I'll show you a little bit more about that in a bit. Um, but as we're talking about and preparing for next year, we pretty much show you a, I'm going to show you a picture of what it looks like in terms of our anticipation on class size, assuming nobody moves in and nobody moves out. So just everybody moves up a grade level. So what happens when the third graders go into Mill Pond and the you know, sixth graders go into Gibbons? How does that affect the schools? And how do those schools look in terms of um, within them in terms of the class size for next year? So I just want to remind you of our um, uh, the class size guidelines that we go bar by in terms of targets set by the school committee. Um, the, you know, uh, obviously the, the younger students having smaller classes um, and, you know, starting with the 16 to 21 students in the K-1 range and then getting up at 7th and 8th grade, 21 to 25. So the high end, you know, we try to stay away from being at the high end, but, uh, but those are the ranges um, that we have set in, at, historically as a district. Um, and I think it's important that for context, you know, the ESSER money, which is the federal money that we've gotten for helping us through the 
um, COVID crisis helped us uh, this year add a few positions into the budget that were not originally part of the budget that was voted on by the school committee and then ultimately by the town last year. And so we had hired three new positions to bring down class sizes to keep them pretty, um, particularly low in the early elementary grades, but also there was one position uh, added in, in Mill Pond. So we had three teachers that we added to keep our class sizes lower. You may remember our first and second grade classes are, are really, you know, sort of in the 15, 16 range, hoping that those, knowing that those students would need some extra support, having missed kindergarten and first grade. Um, and so next year, what you're going to see in uh, the charts I present on class size, we've removed two of the ESSER positions from the budget. Um, and so we're assuming that those two additional elementary K-3 teachers will not appear um, next year. Uh, they're not in the district, so down by two teachers at that level. Um, and uh, also, but we, we will keep the one teacher at Mill Pond um, that's in the ESSER grant. There is still ESSER. There's an ESSER 1, you may remember, a 2 and a 3. Um, we still do have funds as a district. That's the ESSER 3 grant. Um, so as to whether or not that one position goes on the ESSER 3 grant, um, that's still part of the discussions as we're making budget proposals to you over the coming weeks. <clears throat> um, and as I noted a minute ago about the, you can see the kindergarten numbers here and how they fluctuate um, over the last 16 years. Uh, we've, I mean, six years, sorry. <laughs> we had two, 291 students come in one, one of those six years and 241 the other. And so what I generally do is I take the average over a six year period, you know, or longer, sometimes I'll, you know, eight years or, but at this point I took of the last six years and I took out the COVID last year's year because it was particularly low. Um, and then, I, you know, the target is 260. It's what I'm guessing for next year. So it's, you know, it's, uh, again, it could be, it could be that bumper crop where that comes in and it, it depends upon how the housing market, um, you know, shakes out in terms of people moving in with young kids and built, I know there's some buildings that are, are gonna go on, um, what the name of the- um, Over by Mount Pleasant, yeah, you know, that development started yeah, to kind of come in so online. The, so that'll add some students. Um, one could also say that, you know, um, there'll be an interest in the new school and with fails that people outside of Westboro would you know, be making their decision based on a new school building, you don't know. So I'm just telling you that's the biggest unknown always is the kindergarten. And so <clears throat> um, the early childhood center is limited by space, so it's not as big an issue. But what you see here is each of our buildings. And so, the, you know, the, we always have more demand um, than we actually have supply for, and, uh, you know, in terms of classroom space at, at the early childhood center. So people want to go to that and um, we get to choose whether we're going to let them in. We don't get to choose when they start kindergarten. So uh, <laughs> they, they come, we give them a space. Um, so uh, th what you see here is, again, with my estimate on the kindergarten number with the, uh, you know, on the one hand, and then we know for sure, you know, how many kids will be graduating and moving to Mill Pond from Fales, Hastings, and Armstrong, right? So that, with the third grades moving up, um, you know, you can see that we're anticipating Fales to go down. They have a big third grade class of 301. It's one of the, uh, is it 301? No, it's 100 and... Three. 101 in the third grade class. So it's a, it has, um, it's, it's yeah, that's right, 101. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but then, you know, that's a, that's an unusually big class that, that, um, so there's this, you know, basically Fails goes down by about 24, Hastings by nine, and Armstrong up by 26 is, is the estimate. Um, and that's in part because they had a relatively smaller kindergarten class this year, and I guess they're graduating. A, very, a small um, third grade class. 
So Mill Pond, analogous, analogously, um, sixth grade class that's leaving is relatively large, so 19, they'll lose 19. Um, Gibbons will lose nine. And the high school, um, they have, you know, the students are graduating, and then the incoming ninth graders will stay basically even with the, they'll lose two students. So overall, this is predicting the district goes down by about 38 students. Um, as I said before, it depends on the kindergartners and it depends on homeschoolers coming back in. Um, so, uh, but assuming that nothing were to change between now and <laughs> um, next year, that's when we move into the, then taking, you know, the numbers that are here, so the 323 at Fales, the 349 at Hastings, et cetera, and looking at our current staff minus the two ESSER positions, this is what class size would look like next year. And you could see that um, this is, you know, it's been a long time since we've had stability and been able to maintain low class size across all our grade levels, but this is a very nice picture to have um, in terms of, you know, our target range. The one to watch at kindergarten is fails, is up at 19, and, you know, uh, so no promises, especially given what I said about it being a new school, that we won't get an influx to some degree there, but that's the current, you know, fails, kindergarten at 19 um, is the largest of the group, but all of these class sizes are within the range of the guidelines of the school committee. Um, so there, there's nothing that usually I would highlight in red, right, a area where there's um, a need for the, uh, an, an additional staff member. So there's no, there's no uh, need that we see for adding staff. Um, and given our recovery phase that we're in from COVID, um, and even independent of COVID, Amber and I have talked at great length about the, 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 the quality of the education in this community is dependent upon keeping cl class sizes, you know, at a very reasonable level. We have kids who are very strong academically. We have kids who are, you know, L's or, or you know, have special services. We, 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 we want to be able to service all of that range of, of, ch of children within the homeroom environment and to be able to, like, give the education that all the kids deserve. Having small class sizes is, um, is something I know you greatly value. Um, Analogously, Mill Pond also is at the uh, you know lower range, which is good in terms of their class size. Nothing is highlighted here in red. Um, there's some back and forth about you know if you 19.5 at grade four versus 23.2 at grade six, you could move a grade four teacher to grade six and bring them down so they're all at about 21. Um, Conversely, fourth grade being younger than, significantly younger in terms of their independence than sixth graders, you know, right now our feeling is we'd rather keep the fourth grade classes slightly smaller than the sixth grade classes. So, but that's, you know, that's the kind of internal discussion that happens and when we get to <clears throat> the spring, if, the, if there's been, you know, mobility into the district during the course of the year that, you know, is making the sixth grade um, averages pop up towards 24 or 25, we, we might reassess that. Um, and at Gibbons, our numbers are uh, stable. The bubble that went through there is the last of its moving out next year. We had a couple of years where the numbers were quite high. Um, and then when we move over to the high school, I'm showing this year's um, sort of picture. There's, we don't traditionally show like a high school average. There's such a different setup in the high school. They don't have like these small teams that you have at the Gibbons School or homerooms like you have at the elementary school. There's, the, there's levels and sections and electives and there's so many different varieties. And so it's useful to talk, you know, in terms of like the number of sections in the school and see that like the variation 
is very, um, you know, it'll go between 10 and 24 students in, 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 you know, the, so like of like the 464 sections, 446, which is like 95% of the, the sections are, you know, less than 24 students. Um, and this year, again, this, I'm talking this year's numbers, and we would anticipate something similar next year, because as I showed you, we're the high school staying stable in terms of the number of students that are going to be in the high school. So we had a few sections this year that are on the higher end, um, but again, it's less than 5%, um, and we're very careful um, when the, those sections are larger. We're very careful about where they land, but sometimes, uh, as we talked about a couple of months ago, it's it, you run up against a scheduling conflict where you have kids who are D-wingers wanting six, certain courses at certain times, and they, but yet everything happens with music uh, at a certain point in the day where then that limits the, num you know, where you can put those students into particular sections of classes, and so the sections that are not meeting during that period of time are going to tend to be a little bit larger. So um, let's see, I'm going in the wrong direction. Um, yeah, and then Amber, I'm going to give it back to over to you in terms of next steps. Yeah, no, thank you. I think oh, it, it's, um, it feels good to be at a place where we're starting to see, I think about, you know, eight years ago when we started with an enrollment projection and felt we were in crisis and even when we were adding staff felt like we were looking at class size numbers that felt big. Um, the commitment by both the town and by school committees that I've worked with over the years to bring in an appropriate budget while also keeping class sizes manageable was much harder. Um, I think that it feels good to see the range of stability in class sizes that are more comfortable to, I think, what we faced in Westboro before the enrollment growth, which feels really nice to get back to that place where we're seeing hopefully um, we're not training as many new faculty. I mean, it's a lot to be onboarding the number of faculty that we've rolled into district over the last five years. So we would welcome the opportunity to go more deeply with them and see a stability in the training group that will be our, our new future, you know, which is nice. Um, so those are things that I feel good about. I, I think that, the housing market has been very hot and fast moving. The thing that's protected us a little bit is there's not a lot of stock in Westboro, but we will see an influx. I think we'd look to probably more kindergartners out there than we realize. Um, I think our K number will come in a little higher than we're guessing. Um, and potentially a return of some people that opted for an additional year of homeschooling. So I think we'll see, I think we'll see plus numbers, but not high. You know, that 40 will probably even out and then and then hopefully small numbers. And, and then I, I believe that we've built in space where I still think we could need to add back in the S, one ESSER position at the elementary level I'm anticipating if the numbers trend the way I think they will. And that would even out that high K, potentially high K it fails or potentially the high first grade at Armstrong. Like uh, we're gonna watch those trends. Those are the ones that I'm watching right now. Um, we do have the benefit of the buffer of the ESSER funds. There's two arenas where I'd much prefer to target that money, which is around some um, intensive special needs that have entered into the district where we don't have that buffer of the 100,000 we usually hold to absorb some of that programming. So it'd be advantageous for us to be able to shift some of that funding. But those are the types of things I'm starting to look at. And right now we move into the watch and wait phase. But I don't think that that watch and wait phase would require a request for a late addition before town meeting of an additional staff because we have the ESSER funds to back us up. So it gives us a buffer year either way. I'm feeling... No, I'm not feeling very pressured around enrollment, which feels really nice, because we have that little bit of buffer of time where we can finish the budget, we can bring in a staffing that I anticipate would then have no 
additional requests at those levels for elementary core teachers. But if our number blossoms in a way where we're in this COVID recovery where we just can't track everything, um, we've got ESSER funds that could that could layer in an additional position for a year and let us watch, you know, more. So that's what I think you'll see from me. I try to start to begin to project for you kind of where I'm looking at numbers now that Daniel's pulled them together. Um, and, and we just start uh, cycling through staffing and plans and see where we end up. Um, so from here, we're going to carry this back to cabinet and to building level principals where we need to start to open up conversations with them um, and group assessment of larger discussions at WLT. Everything will be prioritized into three levels, one, two, and three, and we bring those forward as part of our thinking, and then David and I will be working to continue moving towards those two robust presentations you get that really give you a big picture of all of the numbers as we move into working with AFC. So I think it's a path we know well. It's certainly one we're figuring out together as a new team, um, but I, I have you know, confidence that we're in a good place, as does David, in terms of our timing. Like none of our benchmarks look like we won't hit the timing to have numbers in front of you. Um, and I guess if we pop to the next slide, because we have darling pictures. Look at the, look at, <laughs> look at the sassy that. happy of those girls. They are I told having some them, fun. I said, can I take a picture of you guys while you're having snacks? <laughs> so they were like. They're like, sure. Yeah. They're so happy. Yeah. How many? <laughs> you think Please. of kids who like duck and hide when you want to take their photo, and these girls are like, let us pose. <laughs> this is so cute. Yeah. So I guess I'd open it up for discussion. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. I would just say it's interesting that we, um, estimate like 260 for kindergarten when I know like your graduating class is 300, over 300, probably 300, and you probably know the number from ordering sweatshirts and stuff, uh, 310 it's, uh, or something. 280. Oh, it's 280. Okay, it's so it's lower than I thought. Okay. I, but I know the last year's class was, was higher, and then, so we know we pick up, you know, kids yeah. along the way, and then to see that slide with all the fails will be down 24 next year, and then down nine, and Armstrong's up 26, but and then Gibbons down nine. Like I feel like that never actually happens in reality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think to your point though, this is like having studied profiles as we look at the trajectory of how communities ebb and flow in enrollment. And the same, I went through the same in Wellesley uh, when I was a principal there, which is you're rolling over a lot of houses in Westboro in the last three years, and you have new families that moved in who have tons of toddlers. So you're going to see then that natural expansion of growth back out over time. There's a lot of three-year-olds in town. <laughs> um, and you see that in our requests for preschool. And um, so you might, we might in some of those new families have picked up their oldest who might be like a first or a third grader, but you're seeing that they have, they have little ones. And so I think you'll see that natural growth back. And I, I'm hoping that our original projection of being a district around 4,000 to 4,100 ish, you know, would be nice to settle out in that range as a community. I think it's interesting too, you see it in like the communities in Westboro and where like when, um, you know, 10 years ago we were starting at fails, the number would be like plus 24 on fails right, yeah. and minus 26 yeah, at Armstrong. Minuses, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like the, yeah. the pressure on certain district, if we're mm -hmm. districted, like pressure like on certain districts, yeah, yeah. like ebbs and flows so that, you know, now, you know, numbers are down at fails, but like, the Armstrong area is, you know, getting those kids, like sort of new younger families there, right. whereas like the fails families are older. So you'll look at two things. If you look in your strategic plan when you approve it, um, you saw this in the early drafting, which is next year we'll look at a targeted redistricting um, committee to think about whether or not we want to swing some streets one way or the other to balance our three buildings. But I think the natural growth, I think I wouldn't be surprised to see that the natural grow out of fails will use its space. Oh, yeah. Um, and that will hopefully settle into three buildings of about 375, you know, would be about the right zone to hit, and then they'd all be um, in a good space. When you say that word redistricting, <laughs> <laughs> it sounded as if you were going to say you were saying it's going to happen slowly and yeah. Uh, yeah. thoughtfully and 
a little or maybe bit of not time. at all. I mean, again, yeah. like we'll study it, yeah. and the recovery phase of we won't even we'll start studying it next year, and it wouldn't be until F, it wouldn't be until fall of 24 that you would look at, you know, a, a couple streets rotating, and that's what they did years ago. Or it might not even be necessary because I think that that the build out of the Mount St. Pleasant with 26 houses, you know, is is gonna swing fails back in the direction that that space needed to provide. Yeah. And so you would either redistrict it to one of the other two buildings or you would just let fails make its natural growth. Those are things that we'll decide, but what I think the point I want to make to you tonight is it's nice not to be in a crisis. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, in 2014, we had our back to the wall in terms of, you know, needing to bring in potentially um, additional classrooms through trailers and instead you responded appropriately and now you're going to open the doors of fails. So, you know, I think we're, we're on the phase of actually getting to enjoy the good decision making that you brought to the community. One, um, one additional comment that, you know, Amber, Amber spoke to was one of the comments that I was making was, you know, the housing market. And it really does have an impact. I've seen it, you know, in Somerville and other areas that I've worked in. Is that it's, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out with, um, you know, but post COVID, the market got so hot. And what kind of turnover did you see for people, you know, trying to get some profitability by selling? And what kind of return that occurred? Was it older families? Was it families with young kids? Was it families that aren't on our radar yet that could show in the WEC? at some point. So um, it'll be interesting to see how it all balances out. I think, you know, historically it takes about three years because then you get to assess, you know, if, if, if it's young families, you know, they're starting where they're at and then, you know, what the turnover was. So I think that brings um, kind of a lot of assessment and strategic planning and kind of slow rollout. Um, but to one of the, when she made her comment about redistricting, the first thing that came to my mind was that NRT will be included in this, so <laughs> to, to keep uh, to keep a handle on, on yeah. bus routes. So, um, and that's the first thing I thought of too is like sometimes adjusting two streets makes all the difference in like efficiency with a bus route exactly. or being able to absorb those families into another school. Like it just, yep. it's all part of like the big picture. Yeah. If you can, as Amber and I say, if you could avoid the rotary with a bus, yeah. it's perfect. <laughs> we'll have lots of good time to look at all of that. And I think what's nice is to be in a place where we're not, our back is into the wall on it. We, we have some, some flexibility, which feels good. So I just have a question. And um, I'm, I can be convinced as well. So I'm just gonna like say this question and I'm open. I brought it up last time and the numbers feel so blatantly different from the last five to longer years ago where the numbers were so high and they're so low. And I know that's a good thing. I know educationally, small class size is a good thing. That's why there are class guidelines from the school committee. And I look at the grade three fails in Hastings and I think they're below the guidelines. And yes, it could change when, you know, five students move in and it could change if, you know, suddenly there's a flow somewhere else. So um, since our charge is to uh, oversee the budget and to vote in the budget, it feels like a space for saving, for saving. And if I don't point it out, and I know I pointed it out last time, even though I understand that educationally it is good for students, especially when we're recovering and really fixating on so many aspects of learning, including social emotional and all these pieces that are really probably more prevalent than ever because of the last year and a half, I see, I, I could talk myself into lower class size, that's the greatest thing. But it, from a budget point of view, I see a potential for saving money. And I guess I want to hear from my colleagues. Um, do you see that or are you feeling like we're in a place where it's, we're in the right, maybe we're in the, the, the sweet spot of where exactly we should be? I guess my comment would be uh, it's premature. We haven't seen okay. what the budget is. Um, uh, and I, I think at that point we can discuss what is the impact of the budget. Um, 
we saw a lot of terrible flux. Well, maybe that's the wrong word. A significant fluctuation of what happened last year, up and down, down and up, uh, associated with federal grants. I mean, one thing that we don't know yet is what's going to be the outcome of the educational component of the three trillion dollar uh, uh, request for upgrades, uh, and which case we may be able to continue right where we are. On the other hand, um, you know, I, I see the economic reaching of the town to increase revenue in every every box they can check and to me that's a little disturbing so that's the other pressure to go the other way we know that this the school system and our budget is slightly more than well it is more than slightly more than half of the town's budget and uh, so we we as a school committee have a significant impact on what the taxpayer is going to see and we have all the other peripheral things that we we, we talk about, which is uh, bus transportation. Um, food supplies are likely to go up right through the roof, actually, based on what's going on with uh, the ability to supply uh, the food to the food service. Obviously, um, fuel and electricity uh, are, are going to rise as well. So th there is that counter, and, and your points are well made. I would say, we just need to consider all that when, when you come forward with, uh, and primarily the question is staffing because everything else is going to be driven by whatever the economy is. So let's wait and see. Yeah, I agree, I agree, totally. So we, we need to, we need to when, when the class size goes, what I can call a optimal size, there are opportunities to save on the budgets either save it or pay for something else that needs attention or do something else with it. There's an opportunity for that. Um, and we need to keep an eye. I, I agree with both of you. If, if it's below optimal, just like when it goes above the maximum, we need to seek more money to, to take care of that. Uh, when it goes below, we need to be able to save on that end as well, yeah. One thing we should keep in mind, though, is that um, the town has taxing capacity that it hasn't used yet. That's number one. And number two, uh, the level of interest of the community in a good school system is basically driving why our budget has been successful where we are. Um, I think the taxpayer, at least that the taxpayers that go to town meeting, are voicing what they want in this system. And, and if we came in with something that the taxpayer wasn't happy with, we've seen in the past, not very often, but there's a reaction to it. So the thing is, this community is lucky that it has this capacity. The other side of the coin is that as taxes go up on a per capita basis or per household basis, maybe it's better, um, you know, certain parts of the community can't participate anymore and in fact are driven out of town. So that's the other issue, which is if we raise taxes too high, even if, let's say, the majority of the people want to pay for a good school system, there are others who are going to suffer. And I think that's really the side of the discussion that we need to keep in mind. Sarah, did you have anything? Um, my take on it would be that if you look at um, the research into best practices for what leads to the most positive educational outcomes for students, one of the key factors is smaller class size. Sure. So if we're going to have a student-focused budget, then I would advocate for keeping what we have in place now. When I look at those third graders, they spent their full COVID years as first graders and second graders, which are key developmental grades in terms of learning to read, learning to write, math computation, all those social and emotional skills that they're learning during those ages. And so I worry. They're actually the K-1. They're the K-1s, they're the thank K -1s, you. K-1s, yep. which is even more what you're saying. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, this is the first, you know, so their current second graders, this is their first year of a typical, more typical school year. It's still not typical. And so 
if I were looking at a grade to be smaller class sizes, that's a grade that really might need some targeted intervention because when you hit third grade, you're now reading to learn. Like you are, you are, we're gonna move forward with learning, thinking that your reading and writing skills are more fully developed. And if that's not the case, adjustments will be made. So there's, that's why I would advocate for keeping it the way it is. And so there is this balance between what you just said, which is that the investment of, a, of, of the budget to include these small class sizes is worth what, you know, bringing up. What it may cost. Right, yeah. what it may cost, exactly. And when we look at the budget, we've got to consider all aspects of how it impacts the town. Yeah, and perhaps, you know, keeping a class size small allows the interventions to happen naturally with the teacher versus bringing in outside help or specialists or additional staff to target those interventions when the classroom teacher wouldn't have, you know, as much of him or herself to <laughs> attend to all those needs. So it's been helpful to me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a process by which all of this evolves, and I think that. Um, it is our job to bring to you a budget that represents being able to sustain excellence at the level at which we're currently providing it while we innovate where we can and we cost save where we can. Westpool remains, if you look at the data that we'll put back in front of you, you can look back through your old budget presentations, incredibly cost effective for the level of performance that we attain in comparison to very comparable districts that have just a set of high of taxes or higher. Our tax rate, if you look at Christie's presentation, is right in the middle of the bell curve of our comparative communities. And we have incredibly uh, strong, robust AAA rating savings in terms of where we are in terms of being a fiscally sound town. And we've been providing incredibly strong services. It can't be on the back of faculty that we limit building those coffers and creating even more sustainability in that protected tax rate if it means that our faculty have to face the hardest job that exists right now under a more extensive burden where we're giving them more students and telling them to just work harder and faster. And my job is to represent to you what I think it takes to provide a quality district where faculty can thrive and students can thrive and provide the quality of service that Westboro expects. And I think you as a set of school committees have made good decisions along the way and we'll try to provide to you, you know, the data that we can to give you time to reflect upon that. That's why these kind of discussions you're having are really productive and it lets every Everyone hear your thinking, and I think our job is to then put in front of you the pieces. I think Christie's report of the state of the town indicated incredibly strong recovery and sustaining fiscal responsibility. We cut a million dollars from our budget in participation to maintaining a quality financial structure at the town level. We are strong participants in bringing forward a very reasonable budget, and you certainly have watched me over the years make cuts, transitions, and manage bringing in incredibly low percentages in comparison to our colleagues across other communities. So. I'm right there with you. I mean, I believe that we work to do that. I doubt you will see a recommendation from me to rise in numbers with these particular um, class sizes as they're being presented. But I, I will certainly continue to look at it, and it will be driven by the overall number. But I believe our charge this year is around recovery and sustaining the excellence we need to. So I think it will be a really robust set of budget discussions. I think um, as David and I roll over the salary numbers and look at it, we look forward to putting it back in front of you. So yeah. it should be good. Yeah. yeah Lots thanks. of good work ahead. Thank you, Lisa, for the discussion. It's, you know, we're always open to talking about these things, uh, you know, and just to let anyone watching know, this is the only time that we actually can, as a body, just sit here and discuss these things. So You guys hold the <laughs> longest, the you hold, the school committee holds the longest, most public budget process of any organization in this town. You see our budget 
multiple times over multiple conversations. You don't see multiple presentations from any other department in this town. The number will come forward and it will get defended, but they do not reveal process. It's, we have a very transparent process because we have a very complex budget. And so I think an investment for FinCom is they get multiple opportunities to hear your conversation and to see our numbers as we move towards working with selectmen and the town to bring our budget forward. But I do think it merits reminding people that we are the most transparent budget process in town. And so I, I think these conversations are really important. Yeah, thanks. All right, we'll move on to our final agenda item, a COVID update and discussion. Which Great. So I put in there for record for you, I'm not gonna open those two documents, but I want to move to the COVID update. And actually, Daniel, I'll have you open up that other document I gave you just for my talking points. Um, I'm pleased to say that um, I believe that we continue to do well in Westboro to move forward with 4,000 students and 750 faculty being together five days a week in full programming across the district. Um, we have had um, breakthrough cases. We have had cases that have occurred. We've recovered quickly. We've utilized test and stay. I, I told you we had some concerns last week, a week and a half ago, that Mill Pond had had a cluster outbreak in a classroom that kind of covered two classroom areas. Um, I haven't received any notations this week that they've had additional cases. We continue to demonstrate a capacity to have protocols that we can introduce to give us good controls over um, implementing the school year effectively. I think our students are highly mask compliant, as is our faculty, and things have been moving along really, really well. So what I want to um, provide for you now, and I'm gonna open my notes and correct my spelling. Um, so, uh, you know, the theme we've used is one that can be frustrating or reassuring to somebody. So that makes it a great theme, right? Some people are frustrated that we're going to go slowly, and some people, you know, feel strongly that we need to go safely. And some people feel that we do need to move more quickly. So the balance is we will go slowly, so we bring everyone along, so they understand decisions. We won't have agreement on every decision. We certainly learned pieces of that last year. So the benefit in going slowly to go safely reassures everyone that our benchmarks will be to make sure that we do any changes based upon safely allowing the most typical experience we can provide as the school year progresses, but we will make sure that we're thoughtful and I want to just open up the conversation by um, benchmarking some important things to you. So one, I told you, if you look at the dates, this is a timeline that I actually have reported on. Um, I talked to our labor board, I talked to you, I talked to the Westboro leadership team. I did a community update indicating that we would apply to the state. I then applied to the state on the 15th and we have received the state's um, acceptance of our application for flexible masking for seventh and eighth grade at Gibbons and for nine to 12 at the high school. Um, that's exactly the trajectory of what we said we were going to do and what we put both in writing and in our public meetings. I think that it's important to read what I have up under the line that says we plan to go slowly to go far safely to indicate that no change will take place until the school committee votes a change of their current policy on masking. So your current policy standing is for masking following the DESE guidelines that were provided at the opening of the school year. DESC is now providing opportunities for flexible masking for those that meet the benchmark. And so we have met the benchmark for Gibbons in the high school. No changes will take place at those settings until we move forward with a thoughtful process. So I just think it's important that we reiterate what that process will look like tonight. I want to commend our community for incredibly high vaccination rates, for safety protocols, for being respectful of keeping small circles of friends through the crisis of last year. We did everything right. And so the celebration of that is that we will take additional steps because we continue to be a community that works hard together. And I really want to celebrate that. 
So what I'm going to continue to say is that from today, which is 10 2021, we're having this discussion now, through the remainder of October, I want to make sure that I'm continuing next kind of discussions around implementation. Um, I will attend the Board of Health next Wednesday to talk with them. And if you scroll down, Daniel, I just want to um, emphasize the language that I used with the Board of Health when I set up my meeting, and, and this is an important point to highlight. We will seek from them recommendations for metrics and kind of general perspectives that they want to adv provide advice on for moving forward with optional masking. The school committee will ask for that, and they are requesting that the Board of Health stay centered on data guidelines grounded in the guidance of the DPH and DESE, and the CDC guidelines based upon measurements acknowledging state and town vaccination and illness rates. So we're really looking for the Board of Health to use data and metrics grounded in the strong um, positive recognition of how our community is doing, as well as the benchmark numbers at our six schools that demonstrate that we're doing well. I want to reiterate as well that last year, and I will be reiterating with this when I visit with the Board of Health, last year we used data to discuss to, to guide our decision making, and we didn't lock in on a set number of like six cases because it's illogical. And I want to call back the words of Dr. Ehrlich who indicated that handling every decision on a case-by-case -case basis allows us to make our best decisions. We focused on each building and each classroom, and we used a day-by-day -day discussion and protocol update as needed with uh, the Board of Health Director to check in on how we were doing, and if we needed guidance from the Board medically, we sought it. I anticipate we will continue that as the methodology we see, but I think it's important for the Board to engage in having a conversation amongst themselves around you know, their range of thinking about advice they might provide to you to consider. So after we meet with the Board of Health, I'll cycle back through all of our favorite committees, and those are really the working groups that have carried us safely through the last year and a half, and I just want to give a shout out of respect to all of these groups. The area superintendents at all of our schools around us will continue to meet and share information. The Labor Board, which is a highly collaborative group of faculty, will come together and help us make good decisions the Board of Health, the Superintendent's Advisory Council, which is the district parent advisory team that guided the FAQ updates that parents received regularly. And we will encourage parents and, and that group will reach out and let people provide questions that will funnel directly to the Superintendent's Advisory so that we can take their feedback and their thoughts. And then, of course, um, the guidelines we currently will get, DESE has really indicated they will provide to, they will continue to provide um, on-ramps and off-ramps. So they're going to continue to update their guidance. They see this year as a progression back towards normalcy. So the letter that they've given us just is an indication that we can begin discussion. And now we get the slow, steady progression back towards more normalcy based upon the benchmarks I just talked about. So I'm pleased that we're where we are. Um, our buildings are running very well. I want to give a shout out to our nursing staff and our faculty who are very responsive to continue to use the test and stay and the protocols of staying home if they have symptoms. Um, and it's put us in a really well leveraged place to start to make some recommendations for changes. So I anticipate that um, after the meeting with the Board of Health on the 27th, I'll start to develop um, some parameters and kind of bumpers, you know, that we would work within in terms of taking steps forward. And that would come back to the next school committee meeting in which I would give you a more kind of robust update. And I think if you look at your calendar, that meeting would be the... It's Tuesday, November 2nd. It's a... Right, we because then we're going down to the board, right. Yeah. So, um, again, I think it's important to understand that changes to the protocol will come through a board 
meeting with the school committee, making a decision as a board that you want to shift your masking protocol. And you've been through this, you looked at the protocols, I would make a proposal, it would go through the safety committee as well, which is the other group that we use um, in collaboration with the labor board and we would bring a set of recommendations back to you. So I guess I would open it up to questions. That's my update for where we are, and I just want to give you time to kind of surface any questions or comments. I do have a question about, um, so there was an email that went out to families the other day about giving permission for testing at school. Hmm. And is that, some people said I already gave permission for my child to participate in test and stay. Was it just like a renewal of that or? Yeah, it was a renewal of that. I think okay. at that, because at the high school you have a lot of parents who knew that their students were, and at Gibbons, that knew their students were vaccinated, so they just have to monitor for symptoms. Got it. So they didn't sign for test and stay. Okay. But because we're now able to do symptomatic testing, so if somebody, we're coming into cold and flu season, yep. so we have an increase in absences right now, but it's just from typical colds. Yeah. So, and like, you know, in the fall, strep goes around and other things. So the, the potential to do symptomatic test and stay would allow us just to check on a student who is having a symptom that we want to make sure we cross-reference so we don't send them home if it's unnecessary. So that would require that, and because they're all minors, it means that parents need to go ahead and sign up their children 7 to 12 to participate. Um, and I think some of them just figured it didn't include them. So it's just a second pass. Okay, thank so you. Let me just ask a question. Yeah, that means if your child has been vaccinated and has symptoms, that they can use test and stay. At the nurse's discretion, for example, if okay. they think, because you do see cases where you will have people that will get a breakthrough. So the question might be, oh, am I getting a breakthrough illness or do I just have a cold? Right. And so they could utilize some test and stay. I'm going to flip my phone here in case Judy texts me and tells me I'm messing up. just want to make sure I'm reading properly. Judy. Beam in the notes if I'm messing up. Because that was up. a no before, um, right? Yeah, so right, right now right. we're using test yeah. and stay, for example, if there's a case close identified, uh, close contacts can access test and stay. We've successfully got our feet under us and we're doing a good job with that. So we've now expanded that some of the nursing staff want to make sure that we can leverage symptom-based checking so that it's like another branch of the program. I want to be clear, I had a parent that emailed me and said, well, is that pool testing? And I was like, no, that is not pool testing. We're not sending that data back to participate in pool testing, we simply are expanding the number of kids that we could access to do a rapid test on, or faculty, if yeah. they have a symptom. Yeah, that's great. Other questions or comments? I have a couple, about couple questions and a couple comments. Yeah. Um, so getting ahead of ourselves, um, if we do go to optional masking or something like that, the indoor winter sports would probably still be governed by the MA, MIAA. Yeah. Great question. So I met with Johanna DiCarlo the other day and we started discussing winter sports and there's layers of complexity um, to athletics in particular. If you as a board make a change for masking at school, we're kind of dealing with our contained population in classes at school. When you're looking at sports, you're looking at going to communities where their vaccination rate can be different and so you'd have mixed protocols. It's just got layers and layers of complication. So, you know, you might have a community that's coming to play with you that's at a 40% vaccination rate, so they don't have flexible masking options, but we might. And what does that do to playing competition? And so there's layers of questions to be answered. Um, I think you're also looking at, you know, more people packed in a smaller space for expended time while they're, you know, breathing heavily. So there's a lot of things to talk about. So I think, you know, Johanna and I started that talk and then as she waits for the, I don't think the MIA is necessarily going to come through with clear guidelines. Um, they're going to let individual schools kind of step forward. So I think that the ADs are going to get together and they're asking the superintendents to get together and to come up with some cohesive practices. So I anticipate going back to that superintendents group and posing some questions, bringing my core group together and just saying what practices should we recommend. I think as much continuity in that as possible makes sense. My other question was there's um, nothing on these letters that says anything about Mill Pond meaning like 12 year olds who are recently vaccinated or now fully vaccinated because um, they're eligible. Yeah, the number's really low. 
It's no, not, there's not that many no, people that are 12. No, I know. Yeah. So, but it, just for the record, I guess that it's given to Emma. It is. It is. So, yeah, you have to apply to the state per building. So right. yeah. they meet the benchmark. Both those buildings meet right. the benchmark. And interestingly, I'll make sure I say this point for the record because somebody else might produce it in an, in an article. Westboro is the first middle school to apply, and we received the clearance. But I think we're also not a six, seven, and eight. We're just a seven and eight. Right. Yep. And so when I was interacting with the state at DESE and they were asking me questions, uh, the fact that we're a classic middle school with a seven eight gives us a clean delineation, whereas other buildings have to deal with the middle school, and so it's more complicated. So, um, you know, they are definitive that it's a combined, it's a combined total of faculty and students that have to hit that eighty percent. So you're clearly only looking at, you're only looking at the middle school and the high school until the next tier of vaccination rate opens up. So I have a question along the lines of, of Sarah's, which is, so this, uh, you know, attestation to the state does not include vaccinated staff members of K, K through 6 or pre-K to 6. As of now, the direction from DESE is only that everyone in a building would then mask until you have 80% of the faculty and the student body has to hit that 80%. So we have faculty at the elementary level who articulated the complexities of teaching with a mask and really looking for flexibility. It might be one of the off ramps that DSE evolves towards because I'm sure they're hearing that range of pressure. So I think it's going to be, I would anticipate potentially, it might be an off ramp that happens because vaccination opens up or it, it's an off ramp that happens because the Delta variant dips so low that they provide an off ramp where they might provide flexibility. And then that would open a door for you to discuss it. So again, I think um, my job to you this year, and this has been one of my perspectives on this, is try to keep the circle of life of COVID conversation as small as possible and talk about homecoming and the borough program and college entrance and all the things that return us to normalcy while we maintain, you know, a tight focus on this. So I'd like to, you know, my goal is that I bring you well prepped stuff. I'll keep you updated on any changes at the state level and give you a picture of when you have a potential on or off ramp that you can talk about and put you in charge of making any modifications to your policy. Well, that helps because anyone watching, we are not discussing K through six right now. Because no, there's not the state a, is not allowing it. And the benchmark is that you can, imp, you have the right as a school committee to implement the guidelines. It's within your purview because we're no longer under a state of emergency to implement the guidelines of the DESC are within your vote and your purview and your policy. If you stepped beyond that, it's out of your lane um, in terms of you can't go beyond. Then you would have other, then the Board of Health could, could indicate that, that you're out of your lane. Um, right now, again, the, the state is no longer under a state of emergency. Superintendents and school committees have been advised that you have within your purview legally the implementation of policy for DESE. So your changes will come with supportive recommendations from the Board of Health and their guidance. We've continued to work very collaboratively with them, which is really good news. Um, so good things ahead. I guess my other question for the Board of Health would be, our policies in place to mitigate the transmission of COVID in our schools, but if families and students are socializing outside of school, um, you know, without masks on, what what is their feeling on the actual effectiveness of that policy in school? You know, should we continue this, or are we getting to a, a point where we're you know extending control beyond where we don't need it? Well, I think, again, you'll have to make those decisions, and that will be within the scope of your capacity, certainly for 7 through 12 right now. The answer to that is what do we see as experience within the school system? Obviously, we have no jurisdiction outside of the school property. And the community, depending upon where you are in the United States, does things that make sense, and others don't. 
So ultimately, it's, uh, it's what our experience is going to be, irrespective of what happens outside, in my opinion. Obviously, if there's a problem, we're going to react to it. We have to. Yeah, I think, I think, again, I think the interesting piece to look at is you have a range of, I mean, currently you're masking in two places, schools and hospitals. You really are the two remaining mandatory masking sites. And public sites transportation. And public transportation. And other than that, you have people living with the flexible masking guidelines within their personal comfort and vaccination. And so I think you'll see, again, this is called flexible masking. I know in talking with faculty and, and in listening to students and families that we'll have a comfortable culture of flexible masking where we'll have a good percentage of, of uh, faculty and students who would continue to mask even if we give them optional flexibility as vaccinated individuals. And so that's a healthy learning environment and a healthy, flexible environment as we step forward. Um, um, we will find the window when that feels like an appropriate policy shift to put in front of you. You then be able to debate those pieces. I think the discussion that will they'll hold at the Board of Health will give you some nice guidelines, and then I'll go and interact with what other superintendents are doing, and we'll just step forward like we did last year. It gave us a really healthy set of parameters to um, guide your recommendations. Yeah, and we'll be able to set a policy, and then it's at the building level that they'll come up with all of those detailed plans. Right. You know, when, you know, you can have optional masking and, and certain times when it won't be an option, you know, just based on... Yeah, and we provided a good set event. of guidelines and benchmarks for that, and, and I think you would see, as we did before, that we will bring forward to you, you know, clear enough guidelines that staff and people aren't confused, and then we interacted with the Board of Health to set those guidelines, which would be okay, we've had, you know, this happen, let's do this range of masking, or full steam ahead, we're fine. So once you're using that data, you can flex the masking guidelines. Just as you saw last year, we flexed changes in classroom settings as we did, as for example, at Mill Pond recently. We didn't do that to the whole building, we didn't do that to the district, we took the targeted intervention of shifting a protocol in a located area, and that's the way I see us moving forward. And, and then the goal will be to kind of work out that range of responses so that staff have guidelines. And then that would be the type of thing we would put back in front of you and give you a picture of how to take steps forward. And then just to finally be very clear that any optional masking that happens at the middle school or the high school would be for vaccinated individuals. Right. DESC's guidelines are clear. I love the example you just gave about Mill Pond so that we could understand what that would look like at the high school or the middle school. You can picture that happening where there is like that Sure, you could this. have an indicated case where you yep. might say for the next two weeks, you know, Smith's sure, class will be, yeah. will be masking. <laughs> right, right. Um, and I would imagine when you go into any class, you're going to find a nice healthy range of yeah. students who will mask. Like, I'm going to go see my grandma in two weeks, so I'm going to mask for the next two weeks because that's what I'm going to do because I have plans. You know, I think okay. we're in a new culture. And I think what I have a lot of confidence in is Westboro's capacity to respect and develop culture and to respond by having a healthy, respectful school climate where we create create, you know, what individuals need in order to thrive, either to use flex masking because they can and our benchmarks allow it, or to mask because that's what they're comfortable with. And that's a decision that they made in their family right. based on, you know, right. who's around them or who they're going to be around. Yeah. And or I'm sure family. Andrew would back this up. I have a lot of confidence <laughs> that, um, you know, that our high school students are really mature enough to be like, if you're coming into a classroom and it's like, today we're masking in this class, you pull it out of your backpack, you put it on, you go to class, and it might be that three of your other classes or your whole rest of your scheduled day, you're not. But we have a lot of, I mean, I think our kids demonstrate that flexibility now in terms of just how they view life at school. Um, you know, so I think we would be in a very healthy place. And if you had a younger sibling who was unvaccinated because they're not eligible or they just, whatever the choice is, that you may mask because your younger sibling is not masked. And so families will make those decisions. And, you know, as much as people say, well, the student may not follow a parent's guideline, it is, the, I believe it's the same parenting perspective about 
how you choose to allow your child to walk out the door and what <laughs> guidelines you set for your, your child. And whether your child is 16 or whether your child is 13, you know, or 10, you set those guidelines. And I know that's hard. I know that's hard. We're parents, you know, I'm a parent. <laughs> So again, I think I'd finish this conversation for tonight with a return to the theme that we've utilized, which is, you know, go slowly to go far safely. And we have very, very strong collaborative groups with the whole range of people that I've mentioned that we'll work with moving forward. And then you would receive an opportunity to act at some point and you'd have lots of opportunity to know the parameters of that. That's my update. Uh, I'm okay. proud of our community that we were able to apply for this and, and at least make it to this point because yeah. a lot of communities can't even have this opportunity. Right. So we'll continue to update on vaccinations as we move and, and illness and everything. And we're going to vote on this, so we may not choose not to use it. We may choose, you know what I'm saying? Like as there's a lot of five members and learn between now and then. So, so, yeah. so one of the things that I would like to see is because nurses are on the ground. They see the reality. When we take a oath, I would like to see their opinion on which way they want us to go, not as an advising mm -hmm. thing. So I'd like to see their opinion to say which way they want us to go. Well, they would, they would, have, a bell, they would have a bell curve. Mm -hmm. I mean, own, so, so they would definitely, would I mean, carry a lot of yeah, yeah, of course, they, they would have a bell curve of response on that. And again, for any person, I'm always going to drive us to the data and the benchmarks of our numbers as, as, a, as a guide to help us. And, and Judy Noonan, the head nurse, has been spectacular and continues to be. And we have many nurses that attended the safety committee meetings. So all of those people definitely, they're, they're a strong, clear voice our nurses and very skilled so they'll definitely be at the table but along his his point which is if at any point the resources in which we have to test symptoms may be greater should we have optional masking because other ailments yeah. exist in the world <laughs> more so without masks mm -hmm. so i would imagine at some point it's possible we could be overloading our nurses yeah. our staff doing those tests and we may have to pivot into another direction, and I would want to know their. Sure, I mean, we have st we can pull on state resources if Provide necessary. They are providing that we haven't that. needed it. Yeah. So, I mean, again, my charge is to bring to you protocols that keep all of the pieces of our district functioning appropriately, and we're not going to, you know, make progress where we we've had, everybody has managed challenges in the last year and a half. So, you know, those continue in some ways, but we've made good decisions each step of the way. So, yeah, yeah. my yeah. priority would be also to provide the resources we need to keep all students in the building. So if they need yeah. help with I feel like the tests, nurses' well, the offices are used to high volume. They're <laughs> high volume in the winter high, It's anyway. a high volume, yeah. It's a high volume in the winter, yes. I agree. Yeah. I, I would suggest we ought to wait for the circumstances to arrive before we solve these problems. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. We don't know what the future is going to be. We we are we are being asked by many different uh, ideas as to what we should do. As uh, Ragu has suggested, that uh, you know, with quality input, our decisions will be better. If, in fact, we need to do something else um, in regards to whatever our experience is after we make a decision, then that's what we'll do. Right. But worrying about hypothetical circumstances at this point is uh, it's unproductive. You sound like Dr. Ehrlich, and he really was able to help us understand that the data will drive thoughtful decision making, and then you're better to be reacting within the framework of where you are, because we have good data and good practices. So again, learn we'll how to shape. react yeah. all year, last year and the year before. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Voice of reason. We're in a much all right, thank place. you so much for that. Because we I can appreciate only it. Do this you know, based on what goes forward. Exactly. Because yeah. that's what the public asks us to do, is to use, use logic, common sense, and the information that's available to us. And so far, we've done well, at least yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the next meeting of the school committee will be Tuesday, November 2nd. So that's a change from our regular Wednesday meeting. It will be the day before on Tuesday, November 2nd, because many of us will be attending the MASC conference November 3rd through the 6th. Um, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I, will that be here, by the way, the meeting in this room? Um, yes, I, uh, I, 
believe so. Yeah. I'd have to go back and look at the our master list. For some list. reason it says Memorial Hall. So. Is the same Memorial Hall? Oh yeah, it is then because we'll be there's a there's a planning board meeting in here, I think. Yes. So we'll so be across we'll the street. Be Thank you, the street. Mr. Durrett. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Wait, the answer could, Thank we, you. could be somewhere else altogether. <laughs> yes. All right, I'll move ahead. we adjourn. Thank you. I'll, I'll second. second. Everybody seconds. Everybody seconds. <laughs> All right. Um, those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you. We are adjourned. Thank you.